Hey everyone, welcome back to the Economic Analyst channel. So the price inflation reports came out this past week. I'm going to go over the consumer price index report analysis this video. And on the next video, I'll cover the producer price metrics. And the numbers that came out for the consumer price index were very eye-popping and shocking. They came out at 1.3%, which was well above what I was predicting on my final demand model. And um, it exceeded my expectations. I didn't really think we were going to get this high. However, uh, there were some indicators that uh, implied that this was going to happen. And I'll go over those later on in the video. Year over year, price inflation has increased by a staggering 9.1% on a not seasonally adjusted basis. Seasonally adjusted, it's 9%. We'd have to go all the way back to 1981 before we would see price inflation rates this high. And um, it seems to indicate that uh, price inflation is building. But uh, as I'm about to go over, dis, you know, despite my prognostications in the past that we were going to be seeing worse and worse inflation, and I have been mostly correct about that, I do have reason to believe that we are going to see the end to the peak price inflation growth rates. I mean, it's not going to be the end to price inflation, but we'll probably see at least a relative peak, if not an absolute peak in this inflation cycle of annual growth rates coming in the next few months. Looking at the price index summary, the energy prices increased by a whopping 7.5% month over month which comprised almost half of the 1.3% increase in the CPI. Food also increased by 1%. And then the shelter component has been the other major concern, growing by 0.6%. So putting in food, energy, and shelter, which are really the most uh, necessary components to sustainable living in our society, that comprised 75% of the growth in this CPI. Year over year, energy prices have increased by a whopping 40%, over 40%. So in other words, one third of this 9% has been this increase in energy prices. And then the other thing that has been quietly building and I have been warning about has been this rising shelter component, which is now up to an annual rate of 5.6%, and that comprises nearly 2% of the CPI. So over half of the annual change in the CPI is from shelter and energy. And as I've noted to you before, we have been seeing shelter prices start to rise and that now the annual shelter rates have increased higher than what they did during the peak of the housing bubble during the 2006, during uh, 2006 and 2007. This was something that I have been warning about using a correlation of the Case-Shiller Home Price Index and taking that annual inflation and then relaying how that would track into the shelter component inflation. So in the modern CPI calculations, they don't take housing prices into direct calculation anymore in their co uh, component for shelter inflation. Instead, they use a derivative of that called owner's equivalent rent, which tends to trend more with rent prices, and that has a lagging effect on inflation, but it still builds, and then it stays higher for longer than what housing prices and mortgage payments do um, in the long run. So all in all, the inflation numbers tend to work themselves out when we compare the old CPI to the new CPI. And I've even done my own analyses on that. But it's suggesting that the shelter component inflation could peak as high as 66 or even go even higher because it doesn't take into account that shelter inflation annual growth rates dropped during 2020 and 2021. And so now this building is a whiplash effect from those dropping rates. It just takes the trending the trending inflation rate and says, okay, if shelter inflation was 2.8%, how high will it reach in about a year and a half from the Case-Shiller peak inflation rate? This is the calculation that it comes up with, and the error rate has been pretty true more often than not during the last four housing inflation cycles. So we'll see how that plays out, but certainly this spike in shelter inflation is, uh, is pushing up the CPI and will likely keep the CPI elevated for longer and keep those annual inflation rates from dropping so quickly. 
So if it does get up to 6.6%, what that means is that the CPI will permanently stay elevated by 2.2% on an annual basis in addition to the other base effects of inflation. So the likelihood that we're going down to 2% anytime soon is non-existent. It's just not going to happen. It's, it's, out, it's out of the woodwork. We're not going to see 2% for the next several years at the very least, okay? So when we take a look at the CPI... Uh, growth that has been going on. We peaked at 9% so far. And this average and median peak has been that we've been increasing on an, on an average and median rate 2022 year to date by 0.9% per year or 0.9% per month. So if we were to track that out and say that we're going to grow at 0.9% per month for the rest of the year, it's suggesting that price inflation will increase up to 11% by the end of the year. I don't think that's going to happen and I'm about to lay out some of my reasons why. But first I want to go over a couple of things on why I missed in my last video. So one of them has been my own error that I, that I created out of this. So this was a mistake that I made. And this goes into my uh, price formulation uh, calculation that I have done using fuel prices. So one of the things that I've been doing for the past few months, ever since I missed the April inflation numbers by a large margin, has been that um, I've been taking and calculating real fuel prices that have been recorded from EIA.gov. So you can go to EIA.gov and look up retail gasoline and diesel prices and use the aggregate for the US. And if you take that average, you can correlate it with the fuel component of the CPI. So essentially, these numbers are updated before the monthly numbers for the CPI come out. And since they partially feed into that fuel component of the CPI, I've been able to run a linear regression analysis and more or less predict what that fuel component was going to be. Now, if you look at the June component that I've got calculated, my prediction would show that it was going to, that we were going to have a monthly in price inflation of 1.2%. We got 1.3. Well, that's very close, except I made a mistake in the calculation. In the last calculation that I made, I did not use the proper um, the proper cell reference. And so when I use when I go back to the improper one, it shows that I was going to have a 0.91% monthly jump instead of that 1.2%. So I did, was not able to see that we were probably going to see a very high spike in price inflation this month. I knew it was going to be high and I knew it was going to be higher than my final demand model, which was showing a 0.7 to 0.8% increase. But uh, at the end of the day, it, it just was, it just completely missed on that. And that was just my own mistake in calculating that formulation. So this time I've got the cell reference quite right. And one of the things I want to point out to you is that the drop in gas prices that we've been seeing for over the last four weeks is now going to feed into next month's CPI. And what it's suggesting is that if we hold true to the trend of rising shelter and food that we've been seeing for the past four or five months, the energy component is probably going to drop about, say, 0.3%, give or take. And that's going to lead to a very low CPI of 0.2%. Saying this, it's dawned on me that my final demand model when we uh, is not going to be quite so accurate in the coming months because it's not taking into account the variations from fuel. It seems to me that the fuel prices tend to have a much more quick quick and direct effect on the CPI for the month on the CPI for the month than uh, just using past previous final demand numbers. So looking at my final demand model, it's predicting that the monthly change will be 0.9%. Yet when I go into my price chart and just do a trend analysis and then factor in what real fuel prices are showing, less if we start seeing a real sharp bounce back in gas prices, which we very well could because we're in the peak months in the Northern Hemisphere for energy consumption, then we're likely going to see an underperformance on the CPI relative to the final demand model. And that's going to cause the final demand model to miss. When I look at the error rate for the final demand model, it is starting to deteriorate, although it's not bad. On a plus or minus 0.5%, the final demand model 
is holding to be 93% accurate. That's really not bad. And on a plus or minus 0.4%, it's down to 83%, and that's when it becomes much less reliable. So what I have done has been created a new final demand model that I will use going forward. And what it does is that it combines the old final demand model with real fuel prices that I've been, been charting and taken into account to be used to uh, calculate what and estimate what future price inflation is going to be. And when I use this new final demand model, it's actually over 95% accurate, but the big telling part is that when it's plus or minus 0.4%, it's over 90% accurate compared to the old model, which was only 83% accurate. So the accuracy of this model is much more precise in the long run. There will be some hit and misses, but it's, it does not happen very often and very much so. So um, in the long run, this is I think that this is going to be much more accurate in the long run. And I'm actually going to use this z plus or minus 0.4% metric to get to bear down and give you a much more, or at least a more reliable estimate of what price inflation is going to lead to in the coming months. So what's the new final demand model showing? Well, since final demand came out at 1.1% this past month, and again, I'm going to go over that in the future video, it's showing a much more reliable estimate that today's price inflation is actually going to increase at about 0.1% for this for the month of July, plus or minus 0.4. So it could go as high as 0.5% increase, could go as low as negative 0.3, and that's much closer to what I'm estimating just using trend analysis and real-time fuel prices. So it looks like, and it seems to bear into the argument that we're probably going to see a little bit of a dip in annual CPI numbers next month because we're seeing a whiplash effect from lower fuel prices. Now, if fuel prices start to escalate back up, then we'll more than likely see price inflation start to rebuild in the coming months. It depends on you know just how those things transpire. But the way that I see things playing out is I do see things playing out where we're going to see monthly growth rates and price inflation on the average start to slow down. And so doing so um, will probably start calming those CPI numbers and keeping it at the peak. We, I do expect the CPI to peak now around 9.5%, threaten 10% in the coming months. And there's some several factors that I want to go over that's been playing into this, okay? So one of those factors has been the money supply numbers. The big telling point of price inflation, the big one, has been money supply, okay? If the money supply is going up, it's going to feed into relative price inflation numbers unless if we get growth in real volume of goods to compensate for that money growth. And right now, what we are seeing is that since the beginning of this year, the money supply has been basically flat. It's grown next to nothing. This is extremely unprecedented. We have not seen this for any sustained, sustainable suspended period of time. And in the coming months, this will likely feed into slower price inflation numbers. Another thing that we've been seeing that has been going on has been a falling uh, commodity prices. So I use an, a commodity index tracking fund to gauge how commodity prices are. And ever since the, the middle of June, they have fallen by almost 20%, okay? This is huge that we're seeing commodity prices correct downwards so quickly. And even though we're not seeing that feed into producer price index numbers yet, I expect this lower commodity prices to feed into producer price commodity numbers very soon. I was actually quite shocked that we didn't see that in June yet, um, but I do expect to see that in the coming months. And that should be one of the deflationary trends that we see um, that would suggest that CPI price inflation, at least on an annual basis, will start calming down and we, we've actually seen peak inflation, okay? Another factor that's been going into this has been the rising dollar, okay? The dollar index has been climbing and since it's been climbing and it's been climbing year to date, it's really been climbing for over a year, this is allowing the American dollar to compete with global currencies for international markets such as oil, such as wheat, certain fruits, 
and metals and minerals necessary components and inputs to create final goods for the consumer price index. And because we're able to get these more cheaply relative to other currencies, this is also going to have a relatively deflationary effect. And I think it's one of the reasons why we're seeing commodity prices um, moderate themselves, okay? Another factor is, is that we're probably going to be going into the fall months very soon. So we're in the middle of the summer right now, but as we start entering fall, fuel consumption is going to drop and that will put some downward pressure on energy prices, which has been a huge component of the CPI. It's been one third of the CPI. So if we start seeing downward trends on energy prices, relatively speaking, that's going to put give us depressed CPI numbers, which will keep the CPI longer. The one factor that has been pushing up the CPI and will probably continue to do so for the, uh, I would say till the end of the year, has been the increase in total debt in the economy. So total debt in, US, in the US economy has been escalating very sharply. In the last year, total debt has increased by 6%. This is huge. This has been $6 trillion of debt that has been created on the back of our GDP. And so because of that, it has, cre it has made a situation where it is pushing up price inflation numbers. So while we're seeing the money supply growth rates flatline, we're still seeing rising debt numbers and these rising debt numbers are continuously inflating prices. When we take a look at the bust that happened in 2008, we see how debt numbers stagnated after a quarter to 2008 and they pretty much stagnated for two years before finally starting to climb again. The, right now we're seeing escalating debt numbers and they are increasing at a faster, faster rate since we have this huge influx of debt from uh, the, the pandemic. And we're seeing this building price inflation numbers. Right now it's showing that as of quarter one, we've actually increased debt by 7%. This has been the highest annual change in debt that we have seen since the 2000s during the peak of the housing bubble. And it is likely that this annual change will probably increase for some time before interest rates catch up and become so expensive that uh, debt is no longer seen as a viable option to use in expenditures, okay? So all of that is factoring in that we will more than likely see price inflation peak into the, um, into the, the waning months of 2022, except for these debt numbers, okay? So there's a few factors working for us in our favor for deflation, one working against us, but I think because of the rising dollar, the depressing energy prices from going into the fall months, the flatlining money supply numbers, and the falling commodity prices, I honestly really do think that um, that's enough to suggest that we're going to see uh, peak price inflation in the coming months. Yet because of base effects and the fact that the shelter component is still on an upswing from the rising housing prices, we'll more than likely see that price inflation will stay elevated through the rest of the year. We'll, we'll, I will relay this information to you as we get more updates in the coming months. But right now it's looking like price inflation is just not going to dip below 9% before the end of this year. And I'm being very generous in suggesting that monthly price inflation will come down to 0.5% by December. It may not even get that low, but we'll see how that transpires. Guys, I thank you for watching this video. Stay tuned for my producer price index report where I'll go into some of the details that came out about that and what that means for headline CPI numbers in the coming months. If you like the content that I provide, make sure that you show me some support. You can always like this channel subscribe or like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, drop me a comment, let me know what you think about all this. If you disagree with my take on this, let me know. I'm always appreciate constructive criticism. You can always relay and chat with the other group members. Let us know what you think about all this as we try to learn from one another. And stay tuned, I'll be uploading the producer price index report uh, video in the next day or two. Once again, guys, I thank you for watching this video and I'll talk to you next time.